Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, hybrid history at high noon across the field, images of Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. Um, we ask that you please hold your questions until the end of the program and our lovely speakers will answer as many as we have time for. Um, additionally, we welcome you to hang out after the program. There will be a book signing in the lobby right outside of the auditorium. If you haven't gotten your copy of the book yet, we also sell it in our museum shop. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome our speakers today, Susan Burkhead, Patricia White, and Sam Whiting. Author and artist Susan Burkhead has lived in rural Northeastern North Carolina for her entire adult life. Her passion for the visual arts charted a professional course that spans decades. Burkhead taught art grades K through 12 in public schools and later art lessons in an after-school setting. She has served in various leadership roles and capacities in the community with a focus on advocacy for the disabled population. Burkhead also serves as a board member of the Shoan Arts Council in Edenton. Currently, she enjoys a creative life as a full-time professional artist and amateur photographer of the natural world. Her work can be found in numerous homes and settings throughout the country. Burkhead enjoys rural life in Shoan County with her husband, Thomas, and their adult daughter, Ashley, who happens to have Down syndrome. Across the field from their home sits Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church, the inspiration for her book. Collaborator Patricia F. White is a native of Edenton. She has been a member of Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church for nearly 60 years. As a faithful lifelong servant of her church, White has served as a trustee, choir member, and choir organist, and in numerous other leadership roles. Currently, she serves as a church administrator. White taught high school family, and life science for 35 years in the Edenton Shoan public school system. As a retired teacher, White continues to serve in various capacities throughout the community. White's invaluable contributions to the book included the church's history, records, photographs, and endless meetings. She is a woman of immeasurable stature and deeply respected by the community. Collaborator Sam Harding is a junior at Northeast Academy for Aerospace and Advanced Technologies. He is one of Burkhead's former students. Harding developed a love of art in its many forms, later expressing himself through the art of photography. He has honed his photographic and digital editing skills by drawing on his passion for trains and landscapes as his favorite subjects. He was invited by Burkhead to collaborate on the book as the photography and graphics editor due to his talent and keen eye. Harding resides in Edenton with his parents, Flint and Cynthia Harding and their beloved chocolate lab, Penny. So Susan, I believe you're gonna lead us off. Welcome everyone. We are so thrilled you're here today. It's wonderful to see your beautiful faces, so many family and friends, and so many of you that I've not seen in a while and have already been able to give a hug, and I just love that. Thank you so much for being here today. Do you feel like you're on one of those field trips? You remember um, when I was teaching, uh, they would bring fourth graders to Raleigh because that was part of the curriculum, North Carolina history. Um, and I'm kind of feeling like that a little bit today, but you are on a field trip, actually. We're going to take a photographic journey across a field to Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. Um, and uh, we're gonna to share today about the book that we, um, wrote that includes many photographs that I've taken, also the history and the amazing story of the first Rosenwald School in North Carolina. So put your hiking boots on, we're going for a walk. I'd like to open the presentation today with the painting that you see on the screen that I did of Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. And as you look at this painting, you can tell that the church is um, across the field, usually soybeans, cotton, peanuts, rotating crops. And it's also banked against a grove of trees and then set against a vast sky. This happens to be our front porch view from our home. And we are blessed uh, to see this ever-changing scene um, daily sunrise weather events um, dramatic events like severe storms that usually transition into a beautiful rainbow and then even at dusk and at nighttime so this ever-changing palette 
and Canvas is just dropped from the sky every single day. And we just love being able to see it from our porch. Um, I wanted to share a quote with you uh, by Aristotle. The aim of art is not to represent outward appearances of things, but their inward significance. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to bring the inward significance of Warren Grove Baptist Church out. We're going to open these church doors wide open and let this story just spill and hopefully fill your hearts today. So how are we going to do this? Well, our book. Um, we recently published a book titled Across the Field, Inspirational Images of Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. Our book is mainly photographs, um, and it was intended to be that way from the beginning. But when we learned more about the history, and especially the history of the first Rosenwald School in North Carolina, we knew that the book needed to have that significance included. And so we're going to take you kind of down that journey today because it's such amazing history to learn about. This is the book cover. And as you can see, here's an example of one of the, those beautiful cloud formations that we get to see. So here's our story. Oftentimes when, when we walk outside, we get to see special weather events, such as a, a rainbow that is just painted from across the sky, from one side to the other, covering the horizon. And then imagine stepping out on the front porch and observing a severe, dramatic thunderstorm. Um, and, and the clouds were so dark and intense that I was taking several photographs. I did not realize until later that I captured lightning. And, and this photograph in particular um, kind of struck something in me as well. And I knew at this point there was something here. I wasn't sure what, but something was stirring in me and saying, something's going to happen with your images. Something's going to happen. And in fact, I captured lightning twice. So the second time I thought, uh-oh, there's a real message here. <laughs> Two times, I don't want three. Um, so I think this was a trigger for sharing these images and that other people would enjoy them as much as I have. So before we explore too much about the Rosenwald School story, Patricia is going to come and share the amazing history of her church. Good afternoon. Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church was organized 1875 by Dennis Harris, Granville Roberts, Harvey Burke, and others. James Warren, a member of the white race, gave the land with only one stipulation that the church be named after him. And because of that, Warren Grove. <laughs> the first structure was built of logs by courageous Christians and hauled on an ox cart. The nails used in the construction were given by the white friends. The first official pastor was Henry Outlaw. We would like to think that maybe that first structure may have looked like this. Then in 1886, the church was rebuilt, replacing that log structure. This was done under the leadership of Reverend Hayes. Our present structure was constructed in 1920 under the leadership of C.B. Smith. And the church has, has, has had many, many numerous renovations, as you can see from the photograph. This section here is the Warren Grove Rosenwald School, which was completed in October 8, 1915. 
This is the cost, the breakdown. The African-Americans donated $486. The white community and the school system furnished $836. The Rosenwald Foundation contributed $300, the maximum amount that they were allowing for the schoolhouses. So the total for the structure was 1622. This structure was renovated in 1983, keeping the exterior and the interior framework. We added Sunday school rooms, a kitchen, and a fellowship hall. I can remember rummaging through that old building as I was growing up, but never knowing that it was the first Rosenwald school built in North Carolina. After the re uh, restoration, we decided to call it the J.E. Tillett uh, Education Building because at that time, I believe he was the pastor. The Rosenwald School was annexed to the main sanctuary in 1994 with three more Sunday school rooms, uh, a conference room, pastor study. The kitchen was enlarged and more storage area added. Then in August of 19, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 2005, a new dining room. And you can see a small portion of that now. And you can see in this picture here, the, the last structure on the end is the new dining room. In the square is the Rosenwald School. Then you'll see the part that was added onto the church from that point on. I pledge allegiance to the flag with liberty and justice for all. In America, during the Jim Crow era, the Deep South was highly segregated, a highly segregated society where racism and anti-Black violence was the order of the day. We all know this history. Liberty and justice did not exist for all. We know atrocities occurred, and I think one of the greatest atrocities was the lack of education for Black students. Appropriated money for education was misappropriated to whites, disproportionately appropriated to whites. Black schools, if they existed at all, were substandard, and much comes under that word. Many of them were deplorable. So how do we go from a few substandard schools, if they existed at all, to over 5,000 within a couple of decades? How did this happen? Well, it boils down to two men, Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. These two men came together on their own to form the greatest philanthropic collaboration in the educational history of our country. Nothing has been done like this since. These two men attacked this challenge with dignity, originality, and sophistication. And here's how they did it uh, without Congress. <laughs> Meet Julius Rosenwald. He was born in 1862, so the Civil War was going on, and he was the son of German Jewish immigrants who fled Europe in the mid 1850s from persecution. He understood what that meant. 
His family settled in Springfield, Illinois, and actually lived across the street from Abraham Lincoln's house. The family established a very successful garment or clothing business, um, which actually turned into an industry, so to speak. And although Julius did not graduate from high school, because at the age of 16, he was working in the family business, um, his talents and gifts for business were beginning to really show up. And um, he seemed to have a gift for marketing, for accounting, for uh, processing, and just streamlining the family business. In 1908, I'm skipping through so much information, but you can research later if you want. In 1908, he became the president of Sears Roebuck and Company, and he transformed it into a retailing powerhouse, especially the mail order end. Um, he became, and Sears became, the Amazon of the day. Do you remember, any of you remember the uh, Sears catalog? Yes. Do you remember the uh, Chris, Christmas wish book? You remember flipping through those and tearing out pages? And uh, I even remember that we used the Sears catalogs to stack on chairs so the children could sit higher. <laughs> there were other uses for that catalog too, but I won't mention that. <laughs> um, by the age of 40, he had amassed enormous wealth, and his philanthropic work began immediately. He was a devout Jew, and he believed in sadaka, which is the practice of charity, but with dignity and fairness. And so he immediately began seeking ways to to serve the community near and far. He funded YMCAs and YWCAs. He sent money to Europe for causes over there. He just jumped right in with, it's unbelievable the, the things that he did with his money even early on. His motto is very simple, give while you live. And he lived by that simple principle. He was keenly aware of the needs of African-Americans during the Jim Crow era, and it disturbed him greatly as to what he was seeing. Uh, there were some riots going on in Chicago at the time, and he was just extremely concerned um, about how all the persecution was affecting communities, especially education. So a banker colleague who he was close to and knew that Rosenwald felt this way and had deep concerns, you know, one day he said, hey, I have a copy of a book that you might want to read. It's uh, titled Up From Slavery, and it's the memoir by Booker T. Washington. I thought you might find this interesting. You can get this on Amazon now. <laughs> but this is the book. Booker T. Washington's book. This book so inspired Rosenwald that he knew that he had to meet this outstanding African-American. So wait a minute, let's see, who is this Booker T. Washington? Well, many of you know his story. He was born into slavery in 1856, 100 years before I was born. And he was born on a farm in Franklin, Virginia. Uh, he, it was not a plantation. It was a small farm. And we actually visited the Booker T. Washington National Memorial Park last June and were able to walk around the farm and see the structures, um, the barns, and, and the lay of the land. And it was just fascinating. His mother, Jane, was an enslaved cook. She named him Booker Taliferio, which is Italian for iron cutter. Little did she know. His father was a white man from a nearby plantation, and Booker T did, never knew who, who his father was. Saying Booker Taliferio was too long, so everyone just called him Booker T. This is the kitchen cabin that Jane raised her children in. And I took this photograph when we visited the farm. It's about 16 by 16. 
It has one door, one small window, a dirt floor, fireplace, maybe a table. Um, can you imagine uh, growing up in this? Um, Booker T did not have his uh, piece of clothing until he was six. And he was given a flak shirt that he said, quote, was an instrument of torture because it was so prickly. Um, his older brother, John, offered a great kindness by wearing the shirt until it was broken in. There was, and you can also see that there was a storage, cold storage on the floor for potatoes. Jane, his mother, dreamed of two things, freedom and learning or education. And so she was able to find a copy of a small spelling book. This is a replica of it that you can also get that he, she gave to Booker T and he taught himself to read with this spelling book. At the age of nine, uh, freedom was finally announced when a man came to the farm and read the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. They were free. They moved to West Virginia, where Booker T's stepfather lived, and immediately uh, set up life there. And they found work in the salt mines and the coal mines, just, again, hard work. One day, while Booker T was working in the salt mines, he overheard two men talking about an uh, institute for Black students in southeastern Virginia, Hampton Institute. And he immediately thought, I want to go there. I don't know when or how, but I'm going to get there. Uh, before he went to Hampton, he did um, have some education in Malden, West Virginia. Finally, though, in 1900, he set off for Hampton Institute. He walked 500 miles to get there. And, you know, to read in his memoir of how that journey transpired is just fascinating, too. But he was accepted, and he quickly rose in the educational field. Um, he was an astute student who um, mastered every subject, and all of his instructors and teachers really noticed um, his outstanding achievement. Eventually, he became the president of Tuskegee Institute at the young age of 25. A farm was purchased and Tuskegee Institute for Black Students, male and female, opened. And this was the beginning. And this truly was a farm. There were chickens and pigs, there were dirt floors, but they had land and they were going to build this institute. The um, building on the far right is still in use today. It was very difficult at first, but they did it. And eventually, from a small farm, Tuskegee Institute was built from the bricks up, literally. The school offered training in skilled trades such as farming, dairying, uh, carpentry, printing, architecture, shoemaking, and brick masonry. In fact, the bricks were so well known that they were in high demand um, all over the area. Women learned all subjects as well, including cooking and sewing. Booker T. Washington believed in order, hard work, cleanliness. He really stressed the use of a toothbrush um, and thrift. He was zealous about education and he had a great sense of humor. He was a gifted writer and speaker and fundraiser for, for Tuskegee. And he spent much of his time on trains traveling to raise funds. And he um, became very close to a lot of wealthy and powerful men because they did support Tuskegee. He led the college from 1881 until his death in 1915, and that's called the age of Booker T. After Rosenwald and Booker T met in 1911 in Chicago at a luncheon, they became fast friends, and both sharing a concern for the lack of education for African-American students, they just wrote letters, they continued to talk. Um, 
Rosenwald went to Tuskegee. He became a, a trustee at Tuskegee, and they just kept talking and talking about what can we do, what can we do. Eventually, they came up with a plan for building schools. Rosenwald believed in matching or challenge grants. He believed in empowering independence. And so, as um, Patricia mentioned earlier, Rosenwald agreed to, to give one third of the funds, usually about $300. The black community supplied one third and then the white school board or school system or community supplied one third. He brought all of those groups together. Five plans were offered for Rosenwald buildings. And the plan that you see here is the one that uh, Warren Grove is. It was a two room, two teacher classroom, schoolhouse, um, and it had a dividing curtain in the middle. This is also um, the same floor plan, but this was I found um, as a tinted or colored plan. And this was included in a pamphlet that had all five plans that you could, could pick from. Soon um, schools were popping up like wildfires. Uh, six started in Alabama near Tuskegee and they were so popular and in such demand and Rosenwald was getting so many letters and requests for schools that he finally had to establish a foundation in 1917. But Warren Grove School opened in 1915. The school movement begun. Let's look uh, just for a minute at the required guidelines for the schools and the characteristics of the building. It's very fascinating. The schools had to be in rural areas. They could not be near railroad track. They could not be built near swamp. Most of the time, they were built on church grounds because the church was the heart of the community. Um, they were heated by a wood stove. There was no electricity. All the schools had a large bank of windows on one side to allow as much natural light in as possible. Uh, even the paint colors were specified. There were few decorations allowed on the walls. They could hang an American flag. They could have uh, maybe a photograph of a famous African-American, or in many of the schools, you will see um, photographs of Rosenwald. They had a classical curriculum, and many times the books they had were used, but they were able to get them. Students were expected to sweep the floor, gather wood, and also draw water before their school day started. And remember, many of them walked to school, so they had already done all of those things before their actual work began. Rosenwald loved to visit the schools, and he did quite often any opportunity that he had. So I kind of call this the loaves and fishes story. This map illustrates the full impact of the school initiative. And every little black dot or area you see marks a schools that were built from Maryland all the way to Texas. And as you can see, you can find North Carolina. And as you can tell, we have the most dense shaded area because by the time the initiative ended, 5,357 schools and relating buildings, buildings such as shops or teacher homes were built in 15 states. At the peak of the initiative, one out of every three Black children attended a Rosenwald school. North Carolina had the most, we had 813. And that's thanks to a man um, that I discovered, Georgie White, who was a delegate for the schools and he just traveled all over North Carolina. I would like to know his story too, because we have the most. Wake County had 27, did you know that? Do you know how many are? are still in existence. There are five in Wake County. In 2017, the North Carolina Office of Archives and History erected a sign marker in Edenton, noting the Warren Grove Rosenwald School. So what's our, our takeaway from this today? 
Um, we've learned about Rosenwald as a very humble human being who had a heart for giving. He lived very well, but he did not live extravagantly. I remember reading one story about how on one of his business trips to Paris, his wife wanted him to bring back some very expensive draperies. When he was in Paris and he saw how much they were, he said, no, thank you, and left them there and came back without them. So I'm sure he was in the doghouse that night. He never bought fine European art or a fleet of cars. His money was, was given away. Booker T. Washington was never deeply involved in uh, politics, civil rights, or activism, and he was criticized for that because of understanding the circumstances going on with segregation. But I think he was a very private person and did not talk about his emotions and his feelings that much. He also experienced a lot of grief. He lost two of his three wives. Um, and I think he was just so busy with um, the Institute and the programs going on that he wanted to focus on that. After segregation ended, the schools were abandoned or repurposed. Only 10% remain, about 500. Ultimately, Julius Rosenwald donated $4.3 million to the school initiative. In today's dollars, that's $73 million. And that was just this one program. Our, our book, Across the Field, offers quite reflection and an appreciation for the natural world through photography, like this image you see. It celebrates the remarkable history of a steadfast and faithful community and church family. And now there's a copy of book in the Library of Congress, so this story and this church and the beauty that surrounds it is preserved for all of posterity. And now Sam Harding is going to come and share um, his contributions to the book. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Harding. I live in Edenton, North Carolina since about 2012. When living in Edenton, I find the landscape of downtown Edenton and the waterfront area being very photogenic, just like Warren Grove with the sunrises and sunsets. And from here is where it started to cultivate my like of photography, capturing these wonderful scenes every day. In photography, I also did a lot of train photography, taking pictures of trains, which is something I was passionate about for a long time and still am with photographs. I had the honor of working on this project, Warren Grove, when I was approached in the summer of 2022. This is a night picture that I was able to take here in Warren Grove with using some flashes to eliminate the church. This is another night photograph taken with the choir light, with the lights inside the church building shining out as the choir were practicing that night. Editing all these photos for across the field was very challenging because oftentimes they weren't always the best photo quality. So it was, we have, <laughs> <laughs> so we had to, had to make sure I was editing them very carefully to make sure it pre preserved all the quality and looked good in the final project, which I think it came out wonderful. This is a panoramic picture looking at the scene of across the field. And this is the kind of view you see when you're riding, through, r passing by on the highway, highway. This is a scene that I saw every morning going to, out in the county for school for many years when I was younger. And I remember seeing this church thinking it was such a pretty scene and I would have never known that I've gotten the opportunity to work on such an amazing project with amazing people. This, Project has been a wonderful thing for me. It's taught me a lot, and think, and I've learned a lot from this this pro wonderful project. Thank you.
Thank you, Sam. He was great. You know, he accepted this challenge. He had no idea uh, what was in store. And we went through, I don't know, 600 or more photographs. But luckily, he lives on uh, in a beautiful home downtown Edenton where we could overlook Edenton Bay. And so that was wonderful. Um, at this time, Patricia is going to come and share a few of her personal comments. And then uh, she's going to join the choir, the Warren Grove Gospel Choir, and they're going to perform several numbers for you. So um, Patricia's going to come, and then when Patricia finishes, she'll walk over there in the choir. Y'all can come on up and join us. This has been an amazing journey for me and the members of the church. The many people I have met, the friendships made, and the confirmation from above that no matter what is going on in this world today, people may be different, but we can live together peaceably, be friends, help each other, and most importantly, love one another. It's dark up here, folks. Being able to, to assist in bringing to the forefront an important part of our her heritage about the first Rosenwald School built in North Carolina and the history of Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church serves as a reminder that the works and the struggles of the past will always be a part of us to share, to learn from, and hopefully, to make the future better for generations to come. I know that God has been, in, has been in the midst of everything that has happened from the first picture taken of the church to the book being printed and telling this rich history throughout Edenton and other venues in North Carolina. Because of Susan's inspirational pictures, in showing God's magnificent handiwork happening around the church, we all can enjoy, we all can admire, and we all can feel the presence of the Lord in every picture and remember our forefathers who really started the journey for us. I leave you with a part of the history that we include in our printed history. Throughout the Throughout the rich history of Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church, members have always paused to meditate on the hardships, the suffering, and the sacrifices of their forefathers who laid the, found, the firm foundation upon which the church stands. And above all, let us not forget the real author of our victories.
as we uh, end our program today, there's one final um, image on the screen that's the last page of the book. And it's a quote from Booker T. Washington. And hopefully we can leave with this today and remember it. And also please share the story of the Rosenwald schools. I did not know about them. And so many people I've talked to did not. It's faded history that we need to keep alive. We should all rise above the clouds of ignorance, narrowness, and selfishness. And I want to thank you for coming today. There's so many of you here that were involved in the book in one way or another, editing, writing. Um, Ju Julie Allred, are you here? Hey, stand up, Julie. Julie was is with yeah, BWNA Books, and they were the production designers and did such a beautiful job. So, and again, um, if you are from Warren Grove or you went to Warren Grove as a child, I think we have some folks here that went as when they were younger. Would you please stand up? Todd, are you here? I see you, Todd. Where are you? Yes, please stand up. There we are. Uh, if you're interested in any uh, more research about this topic that we've shared today, I recommend, of course, Up From Slavery, You Need a Schoolhouse is Excellent. This is also a beautiful book. I have a copy outside on our book signing table. And then we'll close today with a few members of the church who are looking through the book for the first time. This is Miss Lillian Collins. Tassie Casey, and this is a special photograph because this is Miss Tassie Nixon. She's the oldest member of the church, and she'll be 101 or two in May. 102 in May. And when she opened the book and looked at the images, she said, this is the most beautiful church in all of North Carolina. That made everything worthwhile. Um, we've won some awards. We've had book signings. And the church was also open for the Edenton Pilgrimage Tour last year, which was wonderful as well. Um, and this is my website. If any of you are interested in ordering the book online, you can. And so that's it today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Susan, Patricia, and Sam, and the Warren Grove, um, Warren Grove Church Cal uh, Choir. Thank you so much for coming down here today and singing for us. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, as we said, we have a book signing outside. It's right outside the auditorium doors. So we welcome you to head out there, uh, grab your book and get it signed. And um, you can ask our folks any questions that you have for them. Thank you for coming today. And we hope to see you soon.